All right, hopefully you got a little chance to stretch your legs. Appreciate your, your patience here. Um, this uh, segment is gonna focus on uh, what goes in your bag. Um, the way that we approach um, street medicine is to bring our medicines with us uh, in a very mobile fashion. There's all kinds of strategies for this, um, depending on the setting. Like I said before, we have, we have the van, and, and in that it has its own little a version of a clinic. Um, you, some of you may have worked in a in a clinics or, or dispensaries, et cetera, where you have your own supplies. But when you're out, you're going under bridges. You know, there's a lot of things to consider about how to do that. I'll give you a, a little background again about uh, my experiences with uh, medical medical backpacks. Uh, my thoughts on this began to crystallize. Uh, through my experiences with wilderness medicine, I, um, uh, one of my hobbies is uh, mountaineering, and I was a mountaineering instructor for a while. So I got invited on different um, uh, climbing expeditions in which having a backpack uh, was part of the uh, responsibility I had as a healthcare person. This is Mexico, right? Yeah. And this is in Peru. So when you get out with a group of people, you're far from there's a lot of similarities to street medicine. You're far from any infrastructures, uh, healthcare facilities or anything like that. So you really have to take your, your medical uh, equipment with you. And on an expedition, each person that's on the expedition has the obligation to take what they need, you know, the mole skin, the things that they need for their own coughs and colds and things like that. But then as an expedition leader, you have to then also take into account higher level of care, uh, antibiotics, altitude medicine things, stuff that you would need for, for injuries, uh, splinting and things like that. So a typical uh, wilderness backpack, you could look at the, um, at the literature, the textbooks that are out there. There's some actually excellent wilderness medicine textbooks. This is uh, one by Forge, um, and it, it gives you different modules that you can break down your backpack into uh, to address the things that uh, are commonly experienced when you're out in the wilderness. Um, and this allows you then to apply your medical intervention to uh, accidents or whatever happens. Uh, if you get into this at a higher level, then you're, you're dealing with specialized equipment for rescue, and, and uh, it, that's a whole interesting world that I don't know, some of you may be in emergency services, et cetera, so you're familiar with that. One of the things that happens when you're out in uh, remote areas that you have to anticipate if you're gonna get into that is beyond the needs of your group, local people are gonna come up to you and they're gonna say, you know, you know, this person is sick, they have a cough, could you look at this ear? So what I've learned to do is to have a, a part of my medical bag that's reserved for the obligation I have for the, for the team. And then I create another separate uh, unit of limited amount, but you know, definitely something that would be needed then for supplementing an expedition pack. Uh, and these are just the basic kinds of things that you'd put in. Uh, I always have something for the children, you know, to, to kind of build the rapport with, with the folks that you're, you're out with. Um, if you get into that sort of thing, uh, this, is a, this is a book that you may have heard of, Where There Is No Doctor. This is, this is the kind of thing that uh, folks that are, you might leave behind in, in an area where uh, folks can be trained to do things that, uh, you know, without the infrastructure of a healthcare system, they can address their, their needs. And then there's always the kind of medicine that, I, that you call suitcase medicine. This is kind of a joke here, but um, <coughs> where, you know, this is me in the Philippines just going out and working with uh, folks that were uh, in the fishing villages with just, you know, the basic little things that you can do. The impact of this is dubious. Um, you know, you, you, it's... it's it, it's more about the relationships you build, uh, et cetera. So, you know, there's a lot of controversy about suitcase medicine. That's why it has kind of a negative connotation. This is uh, kind of on the edge of suitcase medicine versus um, something more organized, a trip in, in uh, the jungles of Belize. And I was fortunate enough to connect with the uh, Air Force. They actually had a group down there that was doing, uh, they would like take over a, a church or take, take over a school and it was kind of fun to, to see how they did it. And then they would set up separate areas where you could actually get deeper into things that uh, had some medical significance. 
Uh, and of course, wherever you go, if you, if you set up a medical clinic, there's going to be a line of, of people to, to come to you. For street medicine, like I said, uh, there isn't really a textbook per se, but what I've done is I've included um, a manual that I did a couple years ago. It's in your folders. And if you look at, uh, it's basically just a general des description of what a street medicine program is. If you look on page nine, there's a section on the medical backpack. Um, it's not rocket science. It's just what the street teaches you. And each of those numbers, one, two, three, up through 12, they basically represent the Ziploc bags that I showed you earlier. Um, you've, got to, you've got to have the capacity, I think, when you're under a bridge or on the street to respond to certain things because even though this ought to be treated in an emergency room or this ought to be treated in a clinic, uh, sometimes you'll see someone who just was in the clinic, just was in the emergency room, and I remember someone coughing up bloody sputum and I was under a bridge in the rain and I said, well, why didn't you see a doctor? And they said, I did, doc. I, I went to the ER. Oh, okay. And then they said, and they hold up a soggy prescription. This was the one pill and I, it's $70 and, and then this one was $50 and I can't afford it. So I just, it occurred to me, you know, they're not going to come together on this. So I'm going to have to begin bringing at least some care out under the bridges. I don't think you want to pretend that street medicine is adequate care ever. It's not. It's not adequate primary care. Uh, it's only the beginning of the possibility of some kind of better uh, services. But things like this abscess here, we're repacking. Uh, we don't suture out there. There's a lot of things you can learn from wilderness medicine textbooks, actually, that are good principles that you don't want to cause more harm uh, than uh, you have to. Uh, in fact, cause no harm. Um, but you do need to have some basic supplies. Um, you have to be able to bring with you whatever you need to the setting, of course. And so for me, uh, the beginning of that was uh, I started stealing stuff from the hospital. That was my, my first response. I, I would grab some bandage material. I'd grab some, some tape or whatever. And of course, I confessed later. But uh, these are the things that I just started putting in my bag. And, and then as, as our teams got bigger, we began to you know, uh, purchase and eventually got purchasing power to get the equipment that we needed. This is my first pharmacy. This is in my basement of my house. And these are just pills that, you know, have been, uh, in these days you could get good stuff from drug reps. So, you know, I was able to kind of repackage some of this. These are stock bottles and, and stuff that I would then restock my backpack with. Um, now we have a, you know, I should have put a picture of our, our sort of dispensary in our um, office. Um, but this is, the, this is basically what you get in a street backpack. Um, each of these has some logic to it as a unit. And again, this would be a large Ziploc bag for each one of these things. And I've got, we've gotten it down to the point now where we carry a, a bag, and I should have brought one, but it's a backpack, and it has a, our logo on it, which was designed by a, by a homeless woman, um, Operation Safety Net's logo. But uh, this is, is the basic uh, stuff that goes in here. As far as diagnostics, uh, we've, we've kind of compared uh, notes with the folks in Boston. And the things that are on the diagnostic section here will allow you to diagnose a triage pretty much anything that you would, you would encounter um, with the uh, basic blood pressure cuff, stethoscope, uh, a glucometer. A pulse ox is really important if you want to evaluate if somebody's. And you can get those. They just go on the finger. They're real, real simple. Um, the ophthalmoscope and, and a thermometer. Um, I don't know if it's listed here, but you want to make sure that, yeah, you include gloves and something to keep, you know, to clean your hands with out there because you do need to, to do universal precautions. Uh, it's good to have something to dispose of stuff into that's, that's hazardous material that you can take back to the uh, proper uh, facilities to get rid of. But these are things that will get you started. Um, in, our, in our system, anybody who's um, not a licensed physician needs to call me anytime that they that they work with someone and they're giving out prescription medicines. And anybody in the program needs to call me anytime they transport a patient uh, to, a, to an emergency room if there's a, uh, any ambiguity so that we can record what we've done. Uh, this is a, one of our volunteers, uh, 
has a modular backpack. I think this is actually a camera bag that they broke down and they, they were able to, to break down different things so they're easily accessible. Because in the dark, um, you know, you don't always um, know where things are and it's, you don't want to be rumbling through a, a, like a giant purse. And then I, I would suggest this nifty item. This is our logo again, it's made by a homeless woman. And uh, this is something we just take into the street and it's got a little light on it. So, you know, when you're, when you're uh, out there working in the dark, you can, you can get in your bag and you can look at wounds and things like that. So it's a lot of fun, actually. You can design your own, and each volunteer has their own uh, customized version of this. Uh, we use unit doses uh, because you cannot anticipate, like writing a prescription still leaves you several steps from actually being able to get the person the medicines. And as much as you'd like that person to go to the, the X pharmacy that might cooperate, um, there's a lot of things for a lot of people that will keep that from actually happening. So I believe what she's, I don't know which way this is just going, but I think this is probably one of our little uh, mini Ziplocs. And we'll have like one course of whatever it is so that it's already ready to go. Um, you can do that uh, as a dispensary if you have a physician, at least in Pennsylvania. Uh, you don't have to um, count the pills and, and get the lot number and all that jazz. Um, but if you want to get into this in a more organized way, we can, we can try to look at the details of your local uh, situation. This is the size of our backpacks. This is actually um, the bags that we carry, so it's not that, not that much of a, a thing to lift up. Um, again, it's all about going to where people are. This is actually in Burma um, with a group that I, I would love to talk to you about, but uh, the same philosophy, you just you get there, you bring stuff with you that allows actual medical care to at least begin. So that's just a little bit about the background of, of my thoughts on the medical bags. Um, it's important to uh, keep monitoring them so that they don't, you don't get expired medicines um, and uh, make sure that you know, you've got the, the battery power for your various uh, units. Um, and um, the streets will teach you basically what you need to know. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to Mimi, whose uh, group in Santa Barbara has actually uh, gotten a, an organized, systematic approach to this that I think you'll probably learn a lot from. I want to mention also, if, um, if you're interested in sort of seeing uh, our program in action, there's a, there's a DVD. It's a film that was made a few years ago. It's called One Bridge to the Next. Uh, and actually, I could leave this with you guys in case you want to just look at it. Um, it's 30 minutes long. And it just, they came for two weeks, and they followed us uh, on the streets, and especially with three people that were making the interesting transition from the streets into housing. So it's, it's a good resource for, if you want to explain to someone else what the heck street medicine is, this is good. Or have pockets. <laughs> um, Okay, so we're going to get, we have a lunch scheduled from noon to one, and so I'm going to make sure that you get lunch, because you're too hungry, you won't be able to think. But um, I just want to give you a sense of Doctors Without Walls and how we've done what we've done in Santa Barbara. So we, what I was talking about earlier is we have certain members of our teams that when we go out and we do a mobile clinic, we always try and have a person for each of these positions, and these are volunteer positions. So we have an, a doctor, a nurse, and we have mental health, which could be a social worker, it could be an MFT, what other positions? We, you know, LCSW, MFT, drug and alcohol counselor. We always have a student. And in our con um, situation in Santa Barbara, we don't have a medical school. We have UCSB, the undergraduate school, so we generally have pre-health students who come out with us. We do have high school students who come out with us with their parents' permissions. It's actually generally been the child of a doctor or nurse on our teams, which has been a really beautiful experience to have those parent-child dyads. We always um, have a role, this is a very important role, oops, called a PAC pharmacist. And I'm going to be talking about the PAC pharmacist, but this is often an EMT 
or somebody who has, like a medical assistant, somebody who has some basic medical training so that they know what different medications are. <laughs> Thank you. And um, they work very closely with the doctors in terms of dispensing the medicines. Um, we always have, the student is often playing the role of the hospitality person. I'm going to talk about that. We try and always have security, which we, we really describe as peacekeeping. But the idea about that is that when we're doing a medical encounter, and we go out at night, and that is you know, modeled after Operation Safety Net, but the point of that is we all have day jobs, we're all volunteers. So if we had daytime clinics, there would be no one to do them. So we have to do them at night. But it's also a good idea because at night, that's when you find unsheltered homeless people either going to the park meals or hunkering down where they're gonna sleep. So it does make really good sense, which is I think why Jim did it that way, <laughs> to go out at night. So we, we are all out at night, and so when we're all huddled around a person providing care, it's not so much that we're concerned about that person hurting us, but we're not paying attention to our scene safety. So that's one of the first principles of any kind of medical um, provision, is you want scene safety. So that, that security person's usually standing back, just watching the scene, making sure that we're safe as we're doing what we're doing. So that person, you know, we have really one person who has been our security person from the beginning, and he is a community member who um, has no formal training in security, but he's just a person who um, knows the community well and is able to watch our backs. So what we do, we have something called Code Gray, which is if it gets violent, he says code gray and we run. <laughs> That's what we do. We avoid the conflict. We're not there to, you know, so, but basically if it does get sketchy, which it has, we leave. And we, we leave, he stays and we run and he follows us. So the, the comms team is actually a really important part of our organization and that's modeled after um, Doctors Without Borders, MSF, who has, always has a comms team. So they, they write for our website, they do public speaking, they outreach to other organizations. So those, I'm talking about the interns now. So that's like our, uh, separate than this list. So on this list, these are all volunteers. That was a point I was wanting to make. And the PAC pharmacist is one of our most important volunteers. What we've learned from disaster medicine is that logistics is 80% of any deployment. So if you are not organized, if you don't have somebody telling you where to go, who's going with you, and that you have your stuff you know, well prepared, you're not gonna be effective. So the PAC pharmacist is one of our most important logisticians. And the person, the volunteer in our organization who has done the most for our organization around logistics is named Aaron Lewis. And I asked him to put together some slides here. I wish he could be here. Um, he's, a, he's a medical assistant. He, um, I think, is pre, uh, um, he's going go to go to become a PA, and he's pre-PA school. Uh, so he's pre-health. He's working as a medical assistant now. He's a graduate of UCSB. And really, you know, when we started out, like Jim showed you a pack. We have three packs that are like day packs. One's a wound care pack. One's a doctor's pack. And one is um, a nursing pack. So that's how we have three different packs, and then we'll have a hospitality pack, which has white socks, water, and food, that kind of thing. So um, we just, in the beginning, we just threw a bunch of stuff in the pack. We'd go out, we use it up, and then the next time it wasn't there, and we get really frustrated. And you know, we, it, we get really busy. On a busy night, we'll see 30 people in the park. And that's a lot, you know, when you're, it's dark, and maybe it's cold, and it's dis I mean, we keep pretty good organization, but that's a lot of people. We keep paper records at this time. Um, we, oh, that's the other role. Ah, I knew I was missing. The scribe. Scribe. The scribe is one of our other roles. So the scribe is a pre-health student who is writing the notes for the doctor. So our teams, in terms of medical, are doctor-led when it comes to prescribing. But our nurses play a really important role in terms of triaging, doing a lot of wound care, blood pressure checks, glucometer checks. But when it comes to actually getting something out of the pack, it's the doctor who works with the pack pharmacist to say, you know, I need doxycycline. And then the pack pharmacist gets it out. We have everything pre-packed, hands it to the doctor, the doctor hands it to the patient. And the scribe is taking out down all of the notes. The patient signs the note. So there's a, there's a whole process that we've organized. We're working on getting an electronic medical record through um, OpenMRS, which is an open source program. 
but that's involved a partnership with UCSB and getting programmers to help us do that. But that's how we take, we, I mean, keeping medical records is absolutely essential. We really believe that in these clinics, they have to be to the standard of any clinic that we would have for any person. So medical records are a part of that. So I just, you know, we don't have a lot of time, but I just want to put up Aaron's slides and go through them quickly. Um, it, it shows, I think these, these, sh sh these slides show the dedication of our volunteers. This is someone who's never been paid. He just loves this organization and has been volunteering with us for years. So he, you know, our philosophy is that um, what we're doing with street medicine in Santa Barbara is not a person's primary care clinic. We're providing urgent care. There's some very good primary care clinics in the community that are set up to care for the homeless. And we want to help people bridge their care to those clinics so that they can develop a trusting relationship with a primary care provider and get medical care in a, in a place that's more um, really conducive to a thorough exam than a park. So that's part of what we do. We really think of ourselves as providing urgent care. Um, and so it's not only, our role though is not only to treat the disease, but it's also to be bridges into more standard settings of, of primary care. So we're always building trust. And so our packs not only have medicine in them, but they also have hygiene supplies, nutrition, water. You know, we always have soap, we have condoms, we have razors, we have sunscreen in the summer. You know, we try and carry um, rain ponchos during the rain. And so when we've designed our packs over the years, it's changed. We're really looking at what are we seeing out in the field and what do we need to have in our packs to be able to treat the conditions that we're seeing. So like to give you a, an example of, of a condition that we see commonly at certain times of years, a year that, become, that becomes really difficult for us is scabies or lice. So okay, we can give the scabies medicine but then what are we going to then how are they going to get their laundry and how are we going how are they going to get clean clothing and how are they going to wash the medicine off so it gets to be really tricky when you give a medicine to really think down the road how is this going to play out so we don't like to for example start people on antihypertensives when we're seeing them in the park really they need to get into a primary care provider so we we really think a lot about the medicines that we're giving and whether it's a good idea to start a medicine in a park versus whether we want to say, listen, how can we get you to the public health department? What can we do for you so that you can get in and get a provider? So you know it's a negotiation. Um, so you know when we're we're putting our packs together, we really had to think about the community that we were serving and how we could best serve them, and so. What we came upon with the PACs is that the logistics of tracking what was going into and out of the PACs and reordering and stocking was a huge problem for us. And so I would say to anybody who's starting a street medicine program, it's 80% of your problem, logistics. Put a lot of time into planning the logistics. And we, we met for a year planning before we started the women's clinic. You know, just to make sure that when we started it, it was going to be sustainable, and it has been sustainable now for for years. You know, so just that that logistics piece. Never forget how important that is. In our packs, we have antibiotics. We do have antihypertensives. We'll use them in conditions where a person says, like for example, you know, when people are incarcerated and they get out of prison, they get one month supply of medicine, right? So then, what do they do? Now, now a lot of times when people are incarcerated in prison and they're they're paroled, they, they're paroled into homelessness because they have to go back to the county where they were arrested, which may not be the county they're from. So now they go there, they're homeless, they get a month's supply of medicine, they don't know how to connect into the medical system. So you know they, know, they will know, well, these are the antihypertensives I take, but I don't know how to get into a clinic and I don't have any more medicine. So in those kinds of situations, we know what they need and we're not really starting them on something fresh. But it's very tricky with antihypertensives. Bronchodilators, a lot of COPD. We need a lot of albuterol, especially in the winter months. Um, topical medications, you know, antifungals are a big, big uh, thing that we hand out. Yeah. How are you sourcing your antibiotics? Like, how are you sourcing your meds? In we buy them okay. from more medical. You know, we buy them from a medical supply company, and we use donated money to buy them. And you know, I. I'm not happy about that. 
I think the hospital should be giving us medicine. I think that we should be getting donated medicine. But there are a lot of politics around this. We're the only organization in my community that, that takes care of the homeless that gives out medicine. Um, Health care for the homeless gives out prescriptions, right? So, you know, we give out medicine. So, so that's what we do is we buy them. Did you have another question? Okay. How much uh, the average pack cost? Like, what is, like, how does that, and what's the turnover? How often are you refilling packs? And how should we think about this at your site? Even on, a, say, a small community like we spoke about earlier in Morgantown, I guess, there was only a set number of uh, underhoused or unstably housed. Like, wh how often are we really thinking about how, like, are we going to have to refill these packs? And so we restock every time we go out. So there's, so the, you know, here's some of the, the lists of the types of medicines we have, antihistamines. We don't give any controlled medicines. We have no benzos. We have no narcotics. We, we do not carry them. That's something I learned from Jim early on. It's a bad idea, right? We have Tylenol and ibuprofen. We have Benadryl. We give those out a lot. People come up to us a lot. Could I please have some Tylenol? And the fact that we then have a, an interaction, we communicate with people, we give them Tylenol is actually very meaningful. But it's really important that we don't, do not have uh, Librium. <laughs> And do you refer them to financial service? Like here we have Medi-Cal, right? So most of my patients at Highland, uh, the majority of them don't have insurance. They kind of enter the system and sometimes a, exit the system. And that's a great question. So do you, you funnel those people toward financial cap? Like, you know, like the ones who are on board to want to access inreach. Absolutely. If they, no, and, and one of the things, it's, it's a great question because what we find is we, when we do our, when our scribe, which we've spent years developing, our intake, you know, our intake form, our, our progress note. And we have certain questions that we ask that are very important for us to understand the population. Where do you sleep? How long have you been sleeping there? Do you have insurance? And you'd be shocked how many people have insurance. They have insurance. They're veterans. They're VA covered, 100%. You say, you're a veteran. You're a disabled veteran. You are 100% covered. I hate the VA. I'm never going to the VA. They do not understand me, and I will not go there, okay? So then our job is, well, we would like to introduce you to this doctor right here who is the doctor at the VA clinic, and he volunteers with us, Dr. Bobby Gaines. He's right here. He, would you be willing to meet him? Yes, I'd be willing to meet him. Okay, Dr. Gaines gives him his card. Would you be willing to come see me on Monday at the VA clinic? So it's that kind of thing, because a lot of people, they'll say, I will never go to the county. They hate me. They treat, me, they treat homeless people with disrespect. So a lot of what we do is then we try and reach out to the county and say, you know, okay, when should we send our homeless people to you that is going to be better for you to, like, hear them? And so there's a lot of navigation around that. For the people that don't have insurance, which there are, there are agencies in our community that are supposed to sign them up for insurance through the County Department of Public Health. We started with about 70 percent without any insurance on our streets and then we we actually have a dedicated um, person that comes in uses my office every Monday and we we're, we're up to like 75 percent now have their uh, insurance which yeah. makes them user friendly to the whole system we um, we do try to work and I would recommend this wherever you are get to know your health care for the homeless entity uh, we didn't mention them yet but that's a huge part of the terrain um, most communities in the country have uh, federally funded health care for the homeless entity and that's uh, when you start off those are people you want to go to first get, introduce yourself uh, maybe volunteer in, in some of their uh, sites they have a certain budget you don't want to break their budget uh, but they have a certain budget for meds and if you determine that you know this person uh, can actually navigate the system then you know we could write a prescription, and they can use <clears throat> vouchers that healthcare for the homeless will pay for those scripts. In Boston, what they do, because they're all integrated uh, under healthcare for the homeless as, as the umbrella that does street medicine, which is actually a little unusual. Usually, the folks that do street medicine are actually not part of healthcare for the homeless. They're a little, little not quite connected in most places. But they just take their blackberries out and they they send a prescription to a pharmacy. And then the street person just goes there and picks it up. So that, that is already paid for through their grant. 
Um, and the other thing that we have, I don't know about out here, but uh, there's certain participating uh, pharmacies that you can get most meds for $4, um, and you gotta get aware of those. Yeah. Here, I think Alameda County is one of the few counties in the nation where the health care for the homeless is within the public health department. Is that correct? That's Contra and Contra Costa. Contra Costa is within is health care for the homeless is within the public health department, yes. and Alameda and Santa Barbara. It's very unusual in the nation to have that arrangement, um, but we are the, among the few. So, it did I answer your question? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we, we also carry stethoscopes, you know, blood pressure cuffs, glucometers, and that, that is where the nursing, our nursing leaders are so important, to do blood pressure checks, to do blood sugar checks. We now have created a system where people come up when we're in the park, and the first thing we do is do vital signs. And um, it took us a while to do that because there's actually, then you have to decide, okay, what am I gonna do if I find out that person has a blood pressure of 220 over 110? Now what am I gonna do? You know, so you, you, you're gonna find that. You're gonna find a lot of uncontrolled diabetics and, and people with hypertension. The other thing that's really important that we finally are doing is pulse oximetry to see what people's O2 sats are because we see so many people with lung disease and you can actually get hemoglobin checkers that are um, through an oxygen, like a sensor, a finger, without taking blood. I think it's really important to know who's anemic because if you're anemic, it's very hard to, you're vulnerable to disease. So we have a lot of wound supplies, we take care of a lot of wounds, and that's gonna be standard for any street medicine program. Um, the dressing changes, it's talking about, you know, just the fact that in, every time we go out, we're doing dressing changes, we're doing wound care. We see people discharged from the hospital um, with, to the street, all the time, you know, and they've got dressings that have not been changed, and they've had a surgery, and so that you, have to, you have to be equipped to take out staples, take out sutures, you're going to see that, have steri strips, that kind of post-surgical care. Um, and then, you know, we have hygiene supplies. But I wanted to get, oh, we, another thing that we've, we're, we've done episodically, which is a really good thing to do, is vaccines. Like you can do flu vaccines a certain time of year. But the other thing that we'd really like to do is tetanus boosters. Because we see people with puncture wounds, we'd like to give them a tetanus shot. The other thing that is very, that we haven't been able to figure that out yet because it's tricky um, to carry vaccines and how do we keep them at the right temperature, but the other thing that would be very valuable for any community is um, PPD, placing PPDs and reading PPDs because generally people cannot get into shelter unless they've had a PPD placed in red and that can be a real problem, but that is also a navigation. We, uh, we actually uh, got a grant which, which from uh, Pittsburgh National Bank that we've been doing for almost 12 years, 15 years now, uh, where we decided that reading PPDs is not gonna work for us with our transient uh, things. So we actually invested that money in buying an x-ray machine and we partner with the county and with Healthcare for the Homeless and we go to the sites and we kind of get the street folks and others to go there so that we can immediately read the films. We actually find a lot of other things and then we layer it on top of that HIV testing and Hep uh, B and C, and we can even give vaccinations for those people who turn out to be positive for one for for A. Vaccinations are great. The, these are just to show you. These are what our packs look like. So this is enough. There's only there should be six, but you know each team deploys with three. This is Perry Kabugas, who's our peacekeeper right here. Part of me. Big arms. <laughs> this, is, this is Dr. Bobby Gaines. He's the medical director of the VA clinic. He's been volunteering with us for years. His daughter, who is a high school student, she's now off at college, came with us for years and started her high school program. There's Aaron Lewis. Um, and this just, you know, this is like a, a group that will go out to the park and then split into teams and do walk rounds afterwards. Um, I just wanted to show you, so, you know, a list of the antibiotics we carry routinely. Amox, Azithro, Keflex, Cipro, Doxy, nitrofurantoin, penicillin, you know, we get what's cheap for the most part, broad spectrum, and then we know what to use it, when to use it when. Um, this is a list of the medicines we carry um, in our packs, but I wanted to show you what we do, this is, this is something that, again, you know, when you have a grassroots organization and you say, we need to do this, 
oh, that's a great idea, but now who's going to take charge of it? Who's going to organize it? What's the logistics of it? it uh, great ideas take a while to actually put into place. This was Aaron, again, another Aaron Lewis brilliant thing. He makes labels. All of the medicines are pre-poured and packed into bags with a label on them. So if the doctor says, I want doxycycline, he knows we always ask for 10 days, you know, 100 milligrams twice a day for 10 days, it's only what we ask for. So he's got them pre-packed into bags with a label on it. And so then we can just write in the field, you know, this is azithromycin, the patient, the date, the location of where we saw, who the doctor was, when it expires, and the lot number on the bag. So we're really giving a high quality of care. And um, we do that with all our medicines. One of the things that I really applaud um, Doctors Without Walls and Mimi's group for is inclusiveness. I think under the philosophy of, of street medicine, there's some things that you know, we could talk about that have to do with everyone has value, you know, respect, grace, these different things. But inclusiveness is one of the core values. And it should be, uh, some of that should be in the, in the manual that I gave you. But you can see how, uh, and one of the things that happens is you suddenly get, once you get the structure of a street medicine program going, you're flooded with volunteers you don't know what to do with. Right. And all that energy, uh, if you can divide it up, and I'm not sure how you achieved that, you almost need a traffic control cop for, um, you know, organizing the, the people that can then do this kind of this work. But that's really I'm valuable. I'm really glad you brought that up, Jim, because what happens when people come and they say, I want to volunteer. And you say, okay, go serve food. There is no job too small in street medicine. If you get a doctor coming out who's saying, I will not serve food, they should really think about a, d a different volunteer opportunity. I've found people come out and, and volunteer with us and say, I'm not being useful enough. I'm trained to do this and that, and you're not using me to do this and that. And I say, OK, go over to some other organization, because with us, you do what you're needed to do, when, and, it, and it's a creative process. Tonight, it might be go change bandages, or it might be go put ibuprofen into a bag and stick a label on it. Because we don't, we don't have the ability to say, OK, you're going to come out. I mean, if you want to do that, you should be in a fixed clinic and do it like that. But in street medicine, we have to be agile. That's the nature of it. So one of the things that happens is we get a certain amount of attrition because people have an expectation of what they should be doing or what their, you know, what, what their level of training is. And then they find out that maybe we're not the right organization. But the ones like Aaron who stick with us, what they find out is they say, he goes, wait a minute, your packs are so disorganized and they're not labeled well. And you're, can I take over that job? And we're like, yes, please take over that job. So there's many jobs that are there that I know about that need to be done, but somebody needs to devote their time to it. And it could be hundreds of hours for them to figure out that simple problem of how to make our website better, or how to make our packs more organized, or how to make sure that our, the clothing in our storage shed is organized when winter comes, that we have the coats here and the you know, women's clothing versus men's clothing. So those people who really dive in and take a problem and fix it, they end up being the ones who volunteer with us for years and then become at a really high level, like Aaron, who's the head of logistics and he's a, a volunteer, you know? So I think that's how we've done it. Do you have an organizational flow chart for, because your, your program's pretty amazing that way. We, we have been working, we've been looking for the champion for our policies and procedures manual for okay. three years. <laughs> that is a really boring job. And I mean, I, you know, really, you, we need a policies and procedures manual. It's sort of written down, not really to my liking. And it, if someone would come and take on that job, it would make our organization much better. It's in my head, our org chart. But basically, um, no. <laughs> but it's something we really, really desperately need, yeah. What have you all developed as far as uh, for language difficulties that you're running out? In fact, you have sort of like a multilingual component with each team that goes out? We, we, you mean for someone who doesn't speak English? We generally have volunteers with us who are bilingual or like me that I, I speak. I'm not proud of my Spanish, but I can get by with my Spanish. So we have people on our teams that can communicate in Spanish. Um, but, and we at different points have had people who are bilingual that we love. But th that's another, it's not, you know, in Santa Barbara with our teams, it's not. Yeah, we it's we use the Google Translator for real crude yeah. stuff. Yeah. But it's, it, you know, it depends on the community you're outreaching to in Santa Barbara. Um, the people that are chronically unsheltered in our community tend to not be only Spanish speaking. You know, it, so it hasn't been an issue for us here as much as it would be here in the Bay Area. You know, but yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a need. 
Um, this, is, this is how we track the medicine that's been used in the field. So when a do if a doctor's volunteering with us, they see a patient, they say, I want doxycycline, they have to go talk to the pack pharmacist, tell them what they want. They don't get to touch the pack. The pack pharmacist pulls the medicine out, hands it to the doctor, and makes checks on their list. And that job of pack pharmacist is at the end of the day, they have to organize what was taken out, and once a week they restock the packs. Because we have three clinics a week plus the women's clinic, so it could be four clinics in a week. So it's every week they're restocking. So that's after hours on their Sunday, you know. Um, so these are, this is just, uh, and here's the ordering system that Aaron has developed for us. So he tells us, now we need more penicillin, and he communicates with our intern who's the um, street medicine coordinator and then she sends a message to our treasurer, who's a volunteer on our board, who then says, okay, here's a little money, let's go buy more penicillin. It's, the, the financial part is really a challenge. Um, there's a lot of politics around the funding of street medicine. You know, where should, where should our homeless dollars go? You know, it's, it's, it's tough when there's not a lot of dollars. Um, so we, this is just, uh, <laughs> we do not use expired medicine. We do not dispense expired medicine. We've been given some really interesting supplies. You know, people want to give you things. They want to give you expired medicine. We got from this big uh, nonprofit that gives medical supplies 100 King Airways. You know, we're not going to intubate people in the field. We're going to call 911. So you know, you get things that you can't really use, and and then it's hard to know what to do with them. And generally, we just say, no, we can't take expired medicine, and we don't need King Airways. Um, Training, this is another thing, and we're over time, so I want to stop because I want to respect your lunch, but one of the things that I love about our volunteers is they have self-organized themselves to do trainings. So now Aaron Lewis is doing trainings for PAC pharmacists, and he's developed that all himself. So we have a whole new cadre of PAC pharmacists that Aaron's trained who are all volunteers. Um, so that's been a great part. Well, okay, I'm going to end there, and Jennifer has an announcement before lunch, and thank you. Oh, that's Aaron. That's Aaron. Mm -hmm. We love you. <laughs> Golden volunteer.